I'm Carolyn Glick. Welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour. I'm joined today by my friend and colleague, Dan Diker from the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, who's a political warfare expert, because he's going to join me in a discussion about uh, the political warfare aspects of Hamas's uh, new campaign against Israel. And uh, so first of all, say hi, Dan. How are you doing? Hi there, Carolyn. All well here uh, in Israel. Glad to be with you on the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour once again. Thanks. So can you give us a sense of what exactly a political warfare, what what the political war is, what the stakes are, and uh, you know the balance of forces as things stand right now, so that our 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 viewers, our listeners, can uh, make sense of the situation. Carolyn, one of the major aspects of the ongoing uh, war between uh, Palestinian leadership, both in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and in Gaza, is what we call in Israel a cognitive war. Political warfare has always been uh, uh, based on cognitive warfare, on the, um, let's say, the conquering of hearts and minds. We know that Great Britain used it in the Second, in, in the second World War. We know that the, uh, the, that the uh, Soviet Union used it. They called it active measures, which is really information operations. In short, how do you convince your enemy's civilian population, that they are in fact uh, wrong and they are in fact on the losing side of history. How do you divide and conquer the cognitive and the, the cognitive sense and the consciousness of the target population? That's the essence of political warfare. Uh, uh, their, you know, political warfare is, is, is as old as, as, as millennia, uh, 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 but I brought two examples just from the 20th century. Here, we have a very sophisticated, Iranian-driven Hamas organization, the Palestinian branch of the International Muslim Brotherhood, um, that has learned over the years that um, that the key to defeating Israel is uh, is in the international court of public opinion is to really dent, if not wound, Israel's international legitimacy as a democratic nation state of the Jewish people. Uh, and I and in my assessment, in this particular round, which is the fourth. Uh, war that Hamas has prosecuted, 2009-10, 2012, 2014, and now again in 2021. I think many in the West forget <coughs> the latest chapter of an ongoing Iranian-driven, Iranian-financed, Iranian-supplied, and strategically directed war using the Hamas and in the South and the Hezbollah, as you mentioned before, uh, in the North in order to prosecute this war against Israel. But what they have done successfully is actually to have mobilized the political class in the United States, namely Ilhan, Ilhan Omar and, um, and Rashida Tlaibe and their colleagues to actually uh, blame uh, America's greatest ally in the Middle East, its only democratic ally, for being war criminals and for being, um, you know, the uh, uh, the... The, the 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 evil party, uh, even though we were the we were the one that was uh, a, a attacked in an unprovoked war, an ongoing war, uh, and therefore um, where the Hamas has been particularly successful, it's mobilized the Israeli Arab um, uh, population. It's incited it's incited the radical network across the Middle East. It's penetrated the the uh, public discourse in the United States, um, casting Israel as the war criminal, when in fact it, it is Hamas that the double that commits double war crimes by firing behind mosques, schools, residential areas, uh, and, and then indiscriminately into Israel. But it has scored a major international political victory, in my estimation, against an Israel that is doing everything it can to um, defend its Jewish, Arab, Circassian, Druze, Christian, Muslim uh, uh, citizens all at once. But it has been unprepared for the ideological war that the Iranian-driven Hamas uh, and radical network has forced uh, has forced upon it, and the result is that Israel is being questioned. Israel's legitimacy is being questioned in the international community, even in the West, as a uh, you know as a as some sort of apartheid uh, war criminal state. But in fact, it's of course the Hamas that continues its double war criminal activities, um, and, and and has somehow flipped international cognition and consciousness against uh, Israel, uh, which is clearly um, by any stretch of, of, or by any measure of fact, 
uh, and and metrics uh, the victim in this uh, in this war. You know, I, I have a slightly different take from you on this, which is that I, I think, um, you know, it, I'm not sure that this is because of Hamas's sophistication so much as it is because of the of of uh, the uh, the left in the United States is g- growing uh, anti-Semitism. I mean, you know, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Um, um, and and uh, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, the Jamal Bowman, and um, there's one other woman who's uh, in the in the squad now. Ilana so, Presley. Ilana and Presley. Ilana Presley, and and the new congresswoman from Missouri, um, and and with the active support as well of, uh, of most of the media in the United States, they have uh, been been really working to criminalize Israel for some time. Uh, together with Black Lives Matter and other far left organizations, regardless of the situation on the ground uh, in Israel, regardless of what's happening in in, uh, Hamas uh, controlled Gaza, regardless of what's happening with the Palestinian Authority. In fact, uh, I mean, it it seems like they have this obsession with Israel that they've been trying to demonize for some time. And, And I don't know that it matters whether they're acting independently of Hamas. I think that they inspire Hamas. I think that Hamas inspires them. They're certainly on the same side as Hamas. They're very much siding with Hamas in this war. But, you know, I I think we don't want to give too much credit to Hamas in this sense, because, you know, they they have been operating this this information operation against Israel. They started in Jerusalem and, uh, you know, they're using uh, Islamic Brotherhood uh, lawyers inside of Israel that are affiliated with the uh, northern branch of the Islamic movement, which is uh, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, which is a jihadist organization aligned with Hamas uh, that have been very, very involved in inciting all of the riots in Lod and in Akko and in other Israeli cities. So, you know, they, they, they have been doing this on the ground and their information operations have been very successful inside of Israel regard, you know, in, in terms of targeting Israeli Arabs uh, to wage violence against their uh, Jewish neighbors and uh, co-citizens of the state of Israel. Um, but I, I, I don't know, why do you think that you would give Hamas credit for this? Because I think that the larger aspect of the, in, the information warfare is that the PLO in particular has spearheaded this information war against Israel now since the 1960s, uh, in, but in concert all the time with the international left, starting you know, in Germany and in Britain and in France and then in the new left in the United States and the, uh, the, the um, what are they called? The, not just the Nation of Islam, but the Black Panthers in the United States were also very involved with PLO. They went to PLO training camps in Amman and Libya and uh, in Lebanon in the 1970s, so that you, know, you, you had this cross-generation of radicalism from the PLO, the Soviet bloc, and into the West through the international left. And I think that this kind of cooperation and collaboration has gone on for decades. And now we're just seeing that, whereas in the past, you know, people like Stokely Carmichael and uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, were really on the margins of Western societies. Today, they've really taken over the uh, social democratic parties in their countries, or the or or the Democrat Party in the United States, the Labour uh, Party in in uh, in Britain, and 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 so this collaboration that has been going on really since the late 1960s, early 1970s between the radical left and uh, and the Arab anti-Semites, the Palestinians. Uh, the PLO and now as well Hamas have really just been, you know, they've coalesced in, in, in a, at a point when these forces in the United States and in Europe have become, um, you know, the ruling factions in their countries, particularly in the United States, but also in Germany and other places. Absolutely, I, I think your 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 analysis is 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 spot on in terms of uh, of this uh, uh, decades long collusion uh, between what at one point was the radical left. Um, and, and then became known as the progressive left in Europe, and then filtering in the United States through the Black Panther movement and so on. But what we see now, Carolyn, which is really a shift, and this is, I do give Hamas credit, they have learned from the, the more secular pal- the PLO, especially the PFLP, Popular Front of Liberation of Palestine, the DFLP, Marxist-Leninist um, branch, 
and, and they have learned the art of political warfare. Remember, Hamas was a was a, um, a fundamentalist, conservative, Islamist party. It still uh, is. And it still is. But what they have learned, especially, and I'll, re I'll remind our viewers, since 2018-19, the Great March of Return, the popular, populist, uh, political warfare move using um, you know, thousands of Gazans without firing rockets and uh, without firing rockets and, and mobilizing drones, but to storm the fence in what in what is a really classic mass mobilization movement um, that the Soviet Union, you know, right out of Stalinist playbook, and they learn from their their West their West Bank, you know, Judea and Samaria uh, PLO colleagues, and they now mix this sort of um, uh, um, uh, search. Uh, a war for international mainstream legitimacy with the traditional rocket missile and you know, what they call Mukawama, this violent uh, uh, uprising uh, using um, using actually advanced uh, weaponry that the Iranians have provided them. So this is what we see now is not only a balance of terror, which is the term that Israeli military planners used in the 214 uh, Hamas war against Israel, but it's a balance of legitimacy. You see Hamas being treated by even by uh, Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, and papers in Europe as being the legitimate counterpart to the state of Israel. We saw when Barack Obama was president of the United States, you saw for the first time the US president willing, in his own words, to mediate between the Hamas and the state of Israel. That was just a clue into this balance of legitimacy. That was the first, you know, sort of inkling that we are looking at a very serious state of affairs in terms of political warfare. Today, Hamas has become a mainstream counterpart to Fatah, the main faction of the PLO. And in fact, Hamas's goal is to replace the Fatah as the leader of the PLO and the Palestinian street in the West Bank and Gaza. And in my estimation, they've done a, they've done a uh, excuse the word, but an admirable job in mobilizing international public opinion against, um, you know, against uh, the state of Israel. You know, I think it's really important at this point because we've been talking about what they're doing, but it's important also to remind our our, our viewers and our listeners um, of who these people are, because, you know, you get, you get caught up in the moment and you forget the fundamentals. So Hamas was established in 1988, um, as the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is sort of the godfather of, of global jihad. Uh, other offshoots of the Muslim Brotherhood are Al-Qaeda, our uh, Pakistani jihadist organizations, I can't remember their names, Lakshar al Taiba or something. Yeah, Lakshar al Taiba. Right, that carried out the, uh, that the, carried out the Mumbai Massacre. uh, massacres in uh, 2000 and when was it? 2014? Yeah, 2012. It was 2012, that, 2013. It killed the whole Chabad, massacred a whole Chabad house in Mumbai. And hundreds of his, of Indians and other Nash and other foreign nationals at hotels in in, in the center of Mumbai. Right. So, so you know, so th these international terrorist organizations, and again, Hamas, uh, Al Qaeda, are of course the most uh, famous ones for for Western audiences. Um, are all offshoots of the Muslim Brotherhood, and uh, and so in their covenant, which they which they declared, where they set out the goals of Hamas in 1988, when they were established by Ahmed Yassin, who was an arch terrorist, um, they call, they explained that their goal is the physical annihilation of Israel and of Jewish people all over the world. So this is a genocidal jihadist organization whose whose declared goal is to kill all of the Jews, to annihilate the Jewish state. Um, they use Nazi-like uh, anti-Semitism in their covenant. That's, uh, you know, they, they talk about the protocols of the elders of Zion. They talk about the Freemasons. I mean, so a lot of this is, is kind of an amalgam of, uh, of Western uh, and eliminationist anti-Semitism, Nazi-style anti-Semitism, and jihadist anti-Semitism. So you see a fusion, really, of West and East in, in, their, in their covenant, but it's all declared a vowed goal 
is the annihilation of world Jewry and of the Jewish state of Israel. So this is a genocidal terrorist organization and the Palestinian Authority on the other hand, which is controlled by the Palestine Liberation Organization and its dominant faction, Fatah. So also the PLO uh, covenant that came out in 1964. So again, before the so-called occupation of the West Bank and Gaza and the unification of Israel happened in 1967, they too call for the elimination of Israel of the Jewish state and its replacement by an Arab state. So both of these groups, both of these warring factions inside of Palestinian society today are completely uh, committed to the annihilation of Israel. The PLO, of course, launched its uh, so-called peace process with Israel in 1993. Uh, and in the framework of that, Israel transferred um, land to the PLO, uh, all of Gaza and um, the Palestinian population centers in Judea and Samaria. And uh, over a period from 1994 till 1996, and, um, and they are uh, and they have used these areas to indoctrinate Palestinians to, you know, seek the annihilation of Israel. They fund terrorism. They give salaries to imprison terrorists who are sitting in Israeli prisons to this day. And so this is a terror funding, a terror inciting, uh, a, a terror legitimizing authority. And uh, Hamas is its competitor, its Islamist, uh, declared Islamist competitor that doesn't believe in negotiating with Israel at all. It just wants to annihilate it. So these are two, two competing groups, and they are the Palestinian leadership, the divided Palestinian leadership. Sometimes they work in concert, particularly when they're both killing Jews. But um, these are the actors inside of the Palestinian Authority. And while uh, in, in the context of carrying out their strategic goal of destroying Israel, a main strategic weapon that they have is information warfare operations against Israel. And that's why I decided at the height of this war to sort of take a parentheses stop, you know, and to discuss what this political war is and what it's doing. So I want to, you know, move this discussion on a little bit because, you know, yet um, at 4.30 in the morning today, I woke up to do an interview with uh, Newsmax and, uh, and uh, it's going to be up on my website as well soon. But um, they showed that I hadn't seen yet, so uh, there it was, but that Rashida Tlaib and um, the Congresswoman from Missouri, whose name I suddenly forget, and AOC all posted tweets, um, it, you know, essentially at the same time or one after the other, saying that Israel is not a democracy because apartheid states can't be democracies, which is just stunning because even calling Israel, which is a multi-party democracy, representational parliamentary democracy, an apartheid state is, is obscene. I mean, you want to start with the fact that the Jews are the majority here of 80% inside of Israel and, and around 65% if we encompass all the Palestinians in Judea and Samaria and in Gaza, as well as Israel's Arabs. So, you know, from a demographic perspective, this is absurd. But beyond that, we're 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 a democracy, and uh, you know, Arabs vote, and Arabs have parties, and Arabs have representatives, and Arabs are completely integrated into Israeli society. They can and do buy land and homes all over the country. There are no restrictions of any kind on them, or on their civil liberties in relation to anything, and certainly not uh, in comparison to Israeli Jews. So. You know, there's literally no truth whatsoever to any of this. Israel is not an apartheid state. And in fact, the 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 uh, State Department definition of anti-Semitism, uh, you know, it makes clear that calling Israel an apartheid state is an is an expression of anti-Semitism. So here you have sitting in Congress and from from the from from the speaker's rostrum in the House of Representatives, you have Rashida Tlaib and her colleagues uh, spewing anti-Semitic bile to the world. Um, and this is something that we've really never seen before. It's completely unprecedented, even in uh, the radical left of the United States. We've never seen this kind of empowered. Uh, these sorts of incredibly powerful voices in American politics uh, engaging in rank anti-Semitic propaganda. And uh, you take that and you then you add to that the fact that 
all of the key people that President Biden has appointed to positions that are in, that are involved with U.S. Israel ties, whether on the Palestinian issue or on the Iranian issue, have made statements over the years and taken actions over the years that all indicate that their sympathies lay with Hamas and uh, that they oppose not only Israel's presence in Judea and Samaria, but Israel's presence on the map. And so, you know, we're we're facing a very different situation and this changes the dynamic and the danger involved, the stakes of the political war being waged against Israel in the West and the and the collusion that we're seeing between Hamas and I think it's important what Dan was saying about the popular marches, right? Is it that that were in uh, when the day of the embassy opening in in May three we, three years ago last week um, from Gaza that these were stunts and they were stunts that were immediately uh, embraced and legitimized uh, by leading uh, members of the of the Democrat Party at the time. And uh, and certainly that those those voices in the Democratic Party from nine, from 2018 have been massively expanded and empowered uh, in the intervening three years. Dan? I'm sorry, Carolyn. Uh, there, there's an important point here. To, I want to pick up on your theme here about uh, Rashida Tlaib and uh, uh, Representative from Michigan and Elon Omar. I, I would suggest that that Rashida Tlaib is a uh, public dress of wearing a black and white keffiyeh, which is unprecedented um, in the, the US Congress, has uh, is actually a violation of the, of the American Anti-Terror Act uh, because the, the, that keffiyeh is a symbol of, of terrorism against civilians. It was worn by Leila Khalid, most famously, um, who, as we know, is a member of the, Pal the Popular Front for the, for the Liberation of Palestine. She was one of the hijackers of a PWA Flight 840 that was hijacked from Rome to Ben Gurion in 1969, and then flown to Damascus. Um, uh, and uh, you know this this keffiyeh that she wore in the house is a, an express um, uh, identification with political violence and terrorism. Beginning in the late in the 1930s, the the Arab the Palestinian riots in the 1930s, um, when the geographic area of Palestine, British Mandate Palestine, was under British of, uh, under British rule, and hundreds of Jews were killed. Um, in the name of those Arab rights. Um, secondarily, um, Yasser Arafat, who recognized as one of the great, you know, the arch terrorists of the 20th century, wore traditionally uh, the black and white keffiyeh as well. So I, I think that Chuck Schumer uh, has his work cut out for him and, and, and at, at the very least should call for censor, public censor of, of uh, Rashida Tlaib for, for, I think, uh, inciting, inciting terrorism uh, by this uh, very public display of terrorist dress in the in the uh, in the Congress, in addition to which, when you call Israel an apartheid state, you're essentially calling Israel a Nazi state. You're calling Israel an, an illegitimate, illicit entity um, that, just like the apartheid regime, was due for uh, was due for uh, dismantling. Uh, and in Israel's case, not only dismantling the government, which was the South African president, but in Israel's case, is calling for the destruction of Israel because you're not really you're not talking about changing the government in Israel. You're really talking about eliminating Israel. And replacing it um, with another uh, Muslim majority, uh, a twenty-third Muslim majority Arab state. This is, and, and I just wanna, I just wanna, I, I wanna, I wanna actually challenge you a little bit on Schumer because, you know, much to I think the dismay of anybody who cares about U.S. Israel ties, not only has Senator Chuck Schumer and Speaker Nancy Pelosi, of uh, the of of the House of Representatives, uh, not said neither of them have behaved like sort of the responsible adult to call these to call these raging anti-Semites uh, in, in the House of Representatives to order. Um, but in a way, they're backing them. Uh, Schumer, along with another very long time uh, a supporter of Israel, uh, Senator Menendez, uh, have both called for a ceasefire, uh, which of course would leave Israel with a lot of unfinished business and it would and it would really redound to Hamas's benefit if there was a ceasefire today before, as I laid out at the start of this broadcast, Israel has secured its its military objectives, particularly with regard to to God's. I think the issue of the Israeli Arabs is something that's gonna you know require a lot of deep thinking and and it's not something that that will end. 
uh, when when the rockets stop uh, shooting from from Gaza, when the missiles stop flying over the the skies of Tel Aviv and Ashdod and Ashkelon, and and other cities around the the country. Um, but uh, uh, I think this is really shocking that both of them did that. And, and Senator Menendez was very critical as well of Israel. This is one of the four Democratic senators, along with Senator Schumer, who voted against the Iran nuclear deal. And now they really uh, being they're adopting this anti-Israel position and narrative. And the other aspect of it is that uh, uh, Gregory Meeks, who's the chairman of the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, is now uh, saying that he wants to hold he he wants to hold a, uh, a meeting about uh, a sale of uh, precision guided missiles that uh, President Biden just approved to Israel. This is you know a routine sale. You know this is not a one off. This is part of the ongoing uh, MOU for uh, military assistance from the United States to Israel. It's a missile sale worth uh, seven hundred and thirty five million dollars. Uh, President uh, Biden uh, informed uh, uh, Congress in a routine. Uh, notification process on May 5th, and suddenly uh, all of the people in the squad, all of the openly anti-Semitic members of Congress are calling for curtailment of aid, blocking the missile sale, and rather than telling them, again, as the responsible adult in the room, that they're ta- that they're disparaging Israel's uh, most important uh, and closest ally in the Middle East, and of course this is absurd and they're not going to do this, uh, Congressman Meeks, who was supported in the past by APEC and was considered pro-Israel, is now saying that he wants to hold hearings on this and he wants an explanation from President Biden about why he approved these missile sales. So I think you know, we're facing a new reality uh, vis-a-vis Congress and uh, and as well uh, with the Biden administration, despite the fact that you know over the past week uh, President Biden has blocked three attempts by the Europeans and the UN Security Council to pass uh, resolutions or uh, utter statements, issues statements from the Security Council condemning Israel, and uh, he's so far um, for a week. Uh, uh, held the line of uh, supporting Israel's right to defend itself against Hamas and is an, an, an illegal uh, uh, terrorist organization, according to the United States government, according to the State Department, um, the, and uh, to defend itself against their missile attacks on its uh, civilians and on its cities. But it just proves that, Carolyn, that you can use the word apartheid or or, or Nazi war, or, or war criminal like uh, you know uh, these members of Congress. And nobody will question it. In other words, this type of mendacious, malign name calling that is not based on fact, it's based on fiction and fantasy. It, and no longer, nobody ever calls this out anymore. I mean, the fact is that Israel may have done, and I'm actually a highly critical of, of Israel's um, organized information operations. I think we, we can do, a, I think Israel can do a far better job in managing uh, the international information aspect of, of this, uh, of this uh, one of many conflicts. But in fact, Israel is probably the only country in the free world that has legal officers on the level of units, on the level of platoons, divisions, that, that basically say before Israel takes any action, that's prohibited according to international law, that's permitted, that's prohibited, that's permitted. And Israel, uh, Israel complies, um, I think, even m- more strictly than any, I would argue, than any democracy in the world in terms of its, its armed operations in order to avoid hitting innocent civilians. And Richard Kemp, um, a, a friend of yours and, 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 uh, and a friend of mine and a friend of Israel, the Jewish people, has said publicly, he was the former senior um, British officer commander in Afghanistan. And he said that Israel, more than any other army in the world, the Israel Defense Forces takes more uh, measures to avoid civilian casualties in the war theater than any other, uh, state, than any other country in the free world. And I think that, that Israel, would do well in order to remind the international community of exactly the type of constraints that we for, that we place upon ourselves in this type of uh, urban warfare when the Hamas does exactly the opposite. The Hamas I would argue. Is- I would argue actually against that. Not that I disagree with you know that that it would be helpful, but I think that the very fact that Israel is in a position where where we've so empowered military lawyers and our second guessing our commanders in the field is evidence of the of the victory of the power of the dominance of the uh, of of its antagonists that people like anti-semites out and out anti-semites like Rashida Tlaib and and uh, and and AOC and and their colleagues in 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 the squad in the congress in 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 the media uh, in Black Lives Matter and in you know just the progressive grassroots, 
they have Israel on the defensive. You know, Israel is not, you know, Israel is with or without a, a lawyer in every in every battalion calling the shots, literally. Um, you know, we didn't need them to begin with because Israel was never carrying out war crimes uh, at any point in its history, in the history of its military operations against Hamas or the PLO or any of its or any of its enemies. So I think, you know, the very fact that we're in this conversation is speaks to Israel's weakness diplomatically, speaks to Israel's weakness in the West and the power uh, and the destructive power really of its antagonists in the international left that again are openly colluding with terrorist organizations that are waging in, in any normal sense, you know, a criminal a criminal war against Israel where each and you know, and this is just, you know, I'm not a big fan at this point of, of international law because I see that there's an international law for everybody in the world. And then there's another, in, you know, imaginary international law for the Jewish state and for Jewish people. Um, so I, I've come to the point where I have a neuralgic, you know, response to to the very concept of it because it, it's not real. But, you know, in the, in the international law that's used for everybody who isn't Jewish, right, every missile attack against civilians is is a separate and discrete war crime. So at this point, you know, say we've had over 3,200 missiles and rockets and mortars shot at Israel over the past week from Gaza, and then another several dozen from Lebanon and Syria. Each and every single one of those of those strikes was a war crime, and yet the people who are being pilloried as war criminals are the people that are that are absorbing these attacks and trying to defend themselves against it. So, you know, I think. You're right. Israel is terrible at uh, international diplomacy, and and I think it speaks really to the, I'm terribly sorry, but to the incredible incompetence of the foreign ministry, uh, and to uh, and also to our legal system. You know, I mean, why is it that our attorney general has been completely silent for the past week and has not taken any action? To defend the country. This is a man who is a former judge advocate general of the IDF. I mean, certainly would be in a position to be making significant uh, uh, statements on uh, in defense of the country, and yet he's been more or less mute. So I think you know it speaks to their incredible incompetence, um, uh, but I but it also speaks to the incredible power of the lie, and and I think you know here the internet the 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 information operation against Israel. Is anti-Semitism like the tool for for uh, building a case that Israel is an illegitimate state? That is is Jew hatred and use of Jew hatred as a as a mobilizing force against Jews by the international left on the one hand, and by uh, the the Palestinians uh, and Iran on the other hand. And here I I, I want to. Um, just because I don't want to go for too long today, we don't want our our uh, our listeners and our viewers to get bored of us before uh, you know because we have so much to say on the issue. But I think that we have to pivot to to the region because one of the audiences for this political warfare, but also for the kinetic war on the ground, are Israel's Arab allies. Are are the Gulf states? Are the Saudis? Are the UAE? Are you know the 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 four states that are signed on to the Abraham Accords that normalized that opened uh, their relations with Israel to the eyes of the world just last year, which is uh, the UAE, the it's Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan, and and Saudi Arabia was expected to join this. Now Saudi Arabia is engaged in bilateral negotiations with Iran, uh, carried out under the auspices of. Of the Iraqi government, which is controlled more, much of it is controlled by Iran, and uh, with the blessing and, and at the urging of of the Biden administration. So, you know, we're seeing a change, and and I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the Arab role in the the wider Arab world and the and the information operations, the political warfare against Israel, their role in it, uh, how they're harmed by it. Um, so and and what this means for Israel's uh, strategic relations and operational alliance that it's built up over the past five years uh, with many of the Arab states in the region. Absolutely, Carolyn. And in fact, um, this pivot is a very important uh, data point in our conversation because it is precisely this unprecedented normalization that the Netanyahu government uh, forged publicly 
uh, that was started privately over the last, um, let's say, seven, eight years, I think, uh, most prominently, even though Dennis Ross would say that it actually started in 2008 um, when uh, then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice was actually read the Riot Act in, in private by at the Gulf at the uh, GCC, the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council meeting, when she went there to try to uh, uh, to try to uh, 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 coalesce the these the uh, Gulf countries against Israel, and they said, "What are you talking about? What are you talking about the Palestinian issue for? The issue is Iran, Mrs. Rice, Dr. Rice. The issue is Iran, and that's what we're dealing with in 2021. And in fact, over the last year, the the, the so-called jihadi resistance network led by Iran and, and Turkey to a degree. Uh, because we, as we know, uh, President uh, Erdogan is a Muslim brother, probably the most important Muslim Brotherhood leader in the world today. Um, they got the shock of their lives uh, when, in, um, in um, I would say, in response to their trying uh, to isolate Israel uh, uh, on all of its borders um, through Iranian proxies, um, uh, Hezbollah and others in Syria, the, the the Afghani mercenaries as well as Hamas in Gaza. All of a sudden, Israel makes uh, Israel and four Arab major Arab countries make peace and normalization. And that leads then, uh, months later, to Mansour Abbas and the Ram Party, even though he's the head of the, the southern branch of the Israeli Islamic movement, makes a an unprecedented move uh, to say that he would join any uh, a Zionist coalition, which is unprecedented. One can have one's opinion about whether this is a tactic, whether it's a strategy, what does it really reflect? From the point of view of the resistance jihadi network, they saw the Mansour Abbas phenomenon as the potential kingmaker in the next Israeli government. Whether that happens or not, we don't know. But they saw it as a direct threat to them. They saw Saudi-led Bahraini, UAE, Sudan, and Moroccan reconciliation with Israel as a direct threat to them. So that so they said the way we've got to we have got to act against this. That's very much in the strategic thinking behind this current warfare is a response to the growing what they call tatbiya normalization between uh, Israel's Arab neighbors, especially under Saudi sanction, as well as the Mansour Abbas, Ram, Israeli, fa Israeli Arab faction uh, development uh, uh, on the inside. This has a major, major effect, I think, on driving um, the jihadi, the so-called jihadi resistance uh, uh, network in the Middle East. At the same time, I think that those in the West, um, even those in uh, some in the administration that say that, um, that former President Trump uh, uh, Abraham Accords is dead on arrival is exactly the opposite. I think the Arab the Arab states in the region proved that the, the former administration's take on the Middle East was, was actually right on target, which is why we don't hear uh, massive criticisms, nor do we buy the, uh, in, this, in Saudi Arabia or in Bahrain or in the UAE or in Morocco, and you don't see demonstrations in the street also. Um, and that's because they know that the, the, the bad guys here, if you will, or the bad people, if you want to be... Uh, uh, politically correct, not just say the bad guys, uh, are Iran and Iran's proxies. So it's really Israel drawing closer to its uh, to its Arab partners in the region versus the Hamas and 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 left wing political left wing radical and progressives in the West. I mean, it's a complete reversal of fortunes here um, uh, politically uh, it, 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 compared to what we saw a decade or two decades or three decades or five decades ago. You know, I think it's really interesting. I, I want to go back to Ram because this has sort of been a, a subject that Gadi and I have been arguing about and then agreeing about. And, you know, there are still a lot of question marks about what Mansour Abbas, the head of Ram, which uh, for people who, are, who viewed us last week, we, we the English term of, for uh, Ram is the United Arab List. And so, uh, you know, we talked about that last week. And, and so I want to get back to that. But, you know, there it, it's really, I think, a question about, you know, uh, you said uh, that Dennis Ross said 2008. I usually date it to 2013, the first time that it was apparent, this operational alliance. But if he wants to get into it with 2008, I would go back to 2006 and the, you know, what was wrongly dubbed the second Lebanon war, when it was really the first Israeli or Ar Iranian Israeli war right. uh, that right. took place in 2006, because yeah. at the outset of that war, um, you know, not only were the Druze and the Christians in Lebanon siding with Israel against Hezbollah and praying for an Israeli victory, they changed in the middle when they started thinking that Israel wasn't serious about winning it. And I think they were right. Unfortunately, we had a pretty horrible prime minister at that time. But um, 
but so were the Arabs, the the Sunni Arab states that we later, uh, you know, signed the Abraham Accords with and have been working with since uh, op- more or less openly, although informally, since 2013. Um, they were also siding with Israel, and they they wanted Israel to win because they saw this as an opportunity to really uh, uh, cast rightly. They saw it rightly as an ability as an opportunity to cast a strategic blow against Iran, which was was already rising in the region as a result of the American mishandling uh, of the war in Iraq. So you know they were they were actually very supportive of Israel at the outset of of that war. But you know, there's a real question, and I don't know the answer to it. And I and and I'm sort of encouraged by what you were saying because I'm a little bit less sanguine about it, which is the the ability of the Abraham Accords, and more importantly than the Accords themselves, the strategic alliance at their heart between Israel and the Arab countries that are threatened directly by Iran to withstand both the Biden administration, which opposes the the Abraham Accords and wants to go back to a Palestinian and Iran centric view of the region, um, but also, um, you know, whether whether as uh, that as a result of the Biden administration, as we're seeing with the Saudis, they're going to try to cut their losses. Uh, and and abandon Israel and try to make a separate peace with Iran uh, to survive. Um, that that is, you know, is is as a result of the Biden administration realignment of America's uh, Middle East policy away from its traditional Arab allies in Israel and towards Iran and the radical axis, the jihadist axis. Whether whether this is powerful enough uh, to to destroy what's been what's been built. And it's been built on the basis of of common interests, and 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 here here's the piece of it that I think that the information warfare plays a central role in, and that that I kind of want to you know that I'd really like to get your your take on, which is this, um, you know, for 75 years basically since Israel was established, the Arab world writ large has been part of this propaganda campaign against the Jewish state, right? They all vote for anti-Israel resolutions, obviously, as a matter of course in the UN, uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council, all of the the Arab League, all of these organizations have been, among other things, you know, military alliances, but also propaganda alliances against the Jewish state. And um, still today, you know, even though it's true they're much weaker, the UAE has you know, been condemning the violence and Morocco sent a big humanitarian aid convoy or whatever to Gaza today to save the Gazans, even though there's no humanitarian crisis. So that, you know, I'm fearful, uh, and the Saudis have also condemned Israel, I'm fearful that in a way they're victims of their own propaganda, that they know on the one hand that siding with Hamas against Israel empowers Iran and harms them. So that siding with Israel's enemy, which is why they didn't in 2014, which is why they sided with Israel against Hamas, which at that point was being defended and and uh, by, by Qatar and Turkey and also by the Obama administration. Um, so they sided with Israel against all three uh, because they, they, they felt they had to. And here's a question, I think they probably still feel they have to, but I'm not sure if they feel that they're able to anymore. And so in the meantime, we're seeing that even if it's haltingly, even if it's, you know, an echo, uh, just a, a, a fainter echo of its of its, of their past propaganda wars against Israel, they're continuing with them. And and uh, and so I fear that as a result of this, they've become sort of the prisoners of longstanding pan-Arab support for the Palestinians against Israel and their propaganda, which demonizes the Jewish state when it seeks to defend itself or acts in its own defense against any uh, Palestinian or other Arab a- a- enemy that attacks it. Well, it's a, it's a very well-taken point, and I think that it points to two vectors that, that we have to take into account. Vector number one is a uh, an unprecedented break between um, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, Fatah's traditional uh, 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 traditional benefactors, Saudi Arabia-led, uh, Bahrain, UAE, the Gulf states, uh, the, the the slap in the face that the um, that the Sunni Arab powers received from the Palestinians r- r- around just around the Abraham Accords and the lack of support 
that these that the Gulf countries um, have received they've received lack of support from the Palestinians on the issue of Iran has been has um, essentially uh, generated and engineered a growing frustration, uh, and, and I would even say disgust, and I choose the word carefully by the Saudi led uh, by the Saudi led uh, Gulf states, and you hear that type of language being used by Saudi diplomats regarding the Palestinians. It should be known that at the time of the Abraham Accords- You think still today those statements are being made in the in the height of the war that the Pal that the Saudis are still feeling capable of, of speaking disparagingly, disparagingly about the Palestinians? Well, they're speaking disparagingly about Mahmoud Abbas and the, and the, and the kleptocracy, uh, you know, the terrorist kleptocracy that they call, uh, you know, the West Bank leadership. As far as the Hamas is concerned, they know that, that any uh, expressed support for Hamas, which I haven't heard from any of the leadership of those four countries, uh, including Sudan, which, as you know, Sudan was the capital of the three no's to Israel's legitimacy in 1967 right. in Khartoum, uh, and that was, you know, arguably the most historic, uh, the most historic moment we've seen in the last year is for Sudan actually to basically say, because of its own interest, that it would actually sign a normalization agreement with Israel. But we have seen relative, relatively, you know, moderate uh, 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 behavioral profiles and, and responses from each of those countries, and I believe. And I talked to, by the way, to a very, I would call it a senior American official who, who said recently that, um, that in this current political environment with U.S. administration sort of re-embracing uh, uncritically the Palestinian leadership and now with this even upgraded uh, a terrorist action by Hamas, <laughs> That the Saudis and their um, their satellites and you know their other client states would work more closely but quietly with Israel because the the Iranian regime threat against them on the ground is and the proxies on the ground is enough uh, that they understand that Israel is their answer, not their problem. Um, and so, with all due respect to the propaganda, and it's very much as a history of propaganda. However, let's be very clear that over the last five, six, seven decades, the Arab world, especially Egypt and Jordan. Have had very mixed feelings about the Palestinian movement as a movement, uh, notwithstanding the beginnings of pan-Arabism, the beginning of the 20th century, and the fall of the Ottoman Empire. But the, as far as the creation of a Palestinian state, the Arab, the Arab powers, beginning with Jordan, we know that King Abdullah, the grandfather, meaning the grandfather, meaning the grandfather of the current King of Jordan, worked actively to prevent this the establishment of a Palestinian state, as well as Nasser's Egypt. Nasser's Egypt thought the new Palestinian state would be a threat to, to you know, the stability of the Middle East. And so on the one hand, they, they engage in this propaganda. On the other hand, there's a very negative, dark uh, history between the Arab states and, uh, you know, and any prospect of an additional, what they thought would be sort of like a Hamas revolutionary destabilizing influence. And they see it before their very eyes here in Gaza. And they know that if Hamas takes over, King Abdullah, um, the second knows of Jordan knows if Hamas takes over the West Bank, which is their goal, then um, they are in big trouble on the eastern side of the Jordan River. So, so I think that we're in a, in a position now where, they, where, where much of the Arab Sunni establishment understands Israel is the solution, Israel is not the problem, and they will continue to work with Israel quietly. But it's up to Israel to continue the outreach to their new um, to their new peace partners in the region and not to uh, rest on any sort of laurels that are less than a year old. Because, you know, I think that you point to a key point and I think it's important, particularly, you know, for our friends in the West who are watching us, you know, to really be aware of this because um, it, it seems to me, uh, both from what you're saying and, you know, from from what, I, what, I, what I've been thinking all, you know, for many years is that um, the, the information war uh, is most important, plays its most strategic role, not in the Arab world per se, where you're not talking about democracies, you're talking about autocracies where, uh, you know, they may use propaganda against Israel as Mubarak did for many decades and as the Saudis have as a means for, you know, keeping, keeping the people sort of uh, to deflect their criticism away from, from the regime and so they blame the Jews, but they themselves are able to, uh, don't necessarily believe their own propaganda. 
that they themselves recognized, whether it was you know King Hussein of Jordan that brought down the PLO in in Black September in 1970, or whether it's Mubarak who you know made the the Muslim Brotherhood illegal and uh, and uh, you know deflected 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 for for 30 years in power, all of these Islamic groups that attacked that killed uh, Anwar Sadat away from him. Um, that they always knew, you know, the real score. That they understood what hung in the balance, and that they that they actually, at the end of the day, uh, uh, viewed Israel with obviously with growing, uh, you know, growing resonance of this view that Israel was the solution and not the problem. And so when you when you sort of recognize that, and you see even still today that the Arabs. You know, at the height of this war, with all of this massive propaganda against Israel and against the Jews going on in a lot of the, you know, Arab media in Al Jazeera and 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 in obviously in the Iranian media and the Palestinian media, um, that the real client, the real address for this propaganda war is in the West. And that, you know, again, if you're saying that the propaganda war against the against Israel is is based upon anti-Semitism, that that's a principal tool that's a mobilizing that's a mobilizing tool. That's that's a that's that's what it's all about. It's all about demonizing the Jews, and in ways uh, like we saw in Hamas's covenant, like we see in the PLO covenant, that that are that are that are very reminiscent of and resonating uh, uh, European uh, anti-Semitic propaganda against the Jews, beginning in the you know the mid 19th century, going through the Nazi period and beyond. Um, that uh, that it's really about the West, and it's really in a way a means to enable the West in the post-Holocaust era to maintain its war against the Jews. That it gives them a legitimate way uh, to hate the Jews, to use anti-Semitism as a as a political organizing tool in the West uh, to build to build a political power. Um, and really, if you look at Rashida Tlaib, if you look at Ilhan Omar, if you look at AOC, I mean, she's a little bit more, she has a more, you know, a, a wider sort of, um, a wider sort of grip on power along a wider spectrum of issues than they do. But that anti-Semitism is a real, is, is really what stands behind Rashida Tlaib's rise, Betty McCollum's rise, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, in a way, his rise in the progressive left, Liz Warren, the same, is is their willingness to demonize Israel and to transform it into the biggest problem in the Middle East, rather than America's most important ally, uh, and to embrace not only the war against American military power, but against the Jews. And so, you know, a lot of people over the past decade here in Israel on the right and I think rightly have been saying, uh, Tubia Tannenbaum wrote a book about it, Catch the Jew, that that the Palestinian war against Israel um, could never go on, uh, couldn't be prolonged in this way, certainly not when it's so obvious that you know, the, the peace process was a ruse, that they never were interested in a state, that they will never accept any settlement for, that Israel will ever offer it. No matter what Israel offers, they will reject it and maintain their war against Israel. This has just been borne out by events consistently since 2000. Um, that really this war can only continue because the West, whether it's the European Union and the states of Europe, uh, the, the American left, um, even the American Jewish left, continues to fuel it. That they continue to support it, that they continue to legitimize it, that the, and and more importantly, that they continue to demonize Israel. And they, you know, they fund these uh, anti-Israel, these anti-Semitic NGOs uh, to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars to wage this political war as their agents. And um, you know, maybe maybe that's really true that this political war isn't so much about the Arab world war against Israel as it is the West's war against well, well, Your point is something extremely important. This could be the climax of our discussion. And that, and that is, see, Carolyn, when you talk about anti-Semitism, people might in, interpret your words as say, oh, Carolyn is talking about traditional anti-Semitism against the individual Jew. And what has happened here is the ongoing Palestinian leadership's war, PLO and Hamas, against Israel, has actually metastasized into a new far more dangerous form of anti-Semitism than we have seen ever before. It's more dangerous than religious anti-Semitism. It's more dangerous than racial anti-Semitism. 
Uh, this is a new form of, of anti-Semitism against collective Jewish community, sovereign Jews in the state of Israel. And in, in the West, and, and I hope our listeners are, are really paying attention to this point, because this is the elephant in the room. People confuse what is, as you've stated, pure rank anti-Semitism against the collective Jew, against the state of Israel, as the expression that was only uh, established, you know, 40 months after the massacre, the mass murder of 6 million Jews was the, was the founding of the, the third uh, Jewish uh, Republic in history or the Jewish Commonwealth in history. Um, and it was only, and it was, and it was because of that mass murder that it was established. So it really represents the collective, what, what, what remained of the Jewish community um, in, uh, you know, in the world at that time. Now, there are those in the West that think that when they call Israel a Nazi apartheid, uh, uh, you know, uh, child killing, ethnic cleansing state, that that's called political criticism. That is not political criticism because there is no other country in the history of modern politics that these types of of ongoing onslaughts, rhetorical onslaughts have been launched against. So only the Jewish state, and that's a proof text of the IHRA. You pointed this out in much of your writing, the, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which has been, has been affirmed by the State Department, affirmed by most countries in the European Union today. This is rank anti-Semitism. And Jewish organizations, Jewish leadership worldwide has to come out and say, that when, when Rashida Kleibe and Ilhan Omar get up and start launching these, as you said it very well, rank anti-Semitic uh, attacks against sovereign Jews, that that is anti-Semitism. It is not political criticism, and it should never be accepted as political criticism. This is the challenge of the hour to diaspora jury, because diaspora jury itself sometimes has a difficult time fighting against what has traditionally been known in anti-Semitism as individual anti-Semitism, as opposed to what, what Professor Bernard Lewis of Blessed Memory has said, no, this is political anti-Semitism. It's the same anti-Semitic Jew hatred root as, as we have known in, in history against individual Jews. This is the challenge of the moment and of the day in order to point out the danger of this collective anti-Semitism and that is masquerading as political criticism, but is in fact more deadly um, and uh, it's more deadly than individual anti-Semitism <laughs> to the right because it is legitimized in the in the paragon of, of international freedom, which is the United States. And if it's if it's legitimized in the United States, we are in big trouble um, because uh, because confusing legitimate political criticism with, with dangerous collective anti-Semitism in the United States uh, means that in other in other countries um, we could be in even in deeper trouble. Right. So, I mean, I think I think we're uh, I want to sort of the last thing that we want to talk about, I think, is what in the heck is Israel supposed to do under these circumstances, because obviously we can't allow this to stand. Um, but, I, you know, I think um, I think it's important just when people talk about political anti-Semitism, look, I mean, you know, this is something there's been this long uh, this long argument about whether. Uh, the, and, and it's important whether the most uh, vitriolic, the most dangerous anti-Semitism is on the political right or on the political left. And I think as the late historian and, and our old friend um, Robert Wistrich from uh, from of uh, of from Hebrew University, a historian of of, of leftist anti-Semitism, pointed out in his work, he he passed away in 2015. Um, you know, the right, the, the Nazi party, the National Socialism, fascism, was actually a creature of the political left. And, and it based a lot of its race theories and particularly its anti-Semitism on Karl Marx's anti-Semitism. And so that, that the roots actually of National Socialism mm -hmm. were Marxism. All right. I mean, it, it's sort of you, know, you can say it's a twisted the twisted limbs of this tree, but this very much is the common roots of national socialism and leftist anti-Semitism that we're seeing expressed today. So national socialism, of course, you know, they lost the war. They were defeated. But the but the concept that Jews as a collective have to be annihilated, which is what Karl Marx thought, he, he believed that you know, Judaism was evil, that, that uh, Judaism was stupid and outdated and antiquated and it had to be sort of be, you know, uh, ended when the Jews would abandon our religious identity, our national identity, our heritage in order to join this communist world revolution. And, you know, there were a lot of Bolsheviks 
who were who were deracinated and anti-Semitic Jews who actually went along with his teaching, you know, and said, OK, we don't want to be Jews anymore. We want to be communists so that the Bolsheviks, you know, the leadership was very much, you know, there was an enormous amount of Jews in the early Bolshevik party in, in, in the Soviet Union in, in, until the mid 1920s when they were purged. And uh, and also in Austria and in Hungary and in all over the place, because they liked this deal. They said it's okay. All right, we're going to give up our Jewish identity and we'll join the Communist Party and we won't be Jews anymore. And that was sort of Marx's idea. And here, you know, you also see expressions of it in the United States with these anti-Israel Jewish uh, activists who use their Judaism as a means to be to serve as fig leaves for for the likes of Rashida Tlaib. I mean, she has these Jews standing behind her every time that she gives a particularly anti-Semitic statement. And they are literally her fig leaves, you know, like you see them in the in the frame with her acting as her as her as her fig leaves to as she disseminates some of the worst anti-Semitic, you know, uh, bilge that we've seen in, in American political history, at least, you know, since Father Coughlin and, and Charles Lindbergh in the 1920s and 30s. So, you know, this is absolutely you know, something that is longstanding. We're looking at it now. It's metastasized into mainstream political party. You know, it's ta it's taken a hold over over the ruling party, really, in the United States. It controls both houses of, of Congress and the administration in the White House. And uh, so we've never seen it so powerful, but we have to understand that this isn't new. This is something that we've seen. So when we talk about political anti-Semitism and Bernard Lewis, uh, uh, his his uh, diagnosis of the situation, or Robert Wistrich's di diagnosis of the situation, already twenty years ago, thirty years ago, forty years ago, that this is just sort of a new uh, a new uh, form or a new expression of left wing uh, Jew hatred that rejects the po the, the the political ex uh, existence of Jews, the religious existence, the the communal existence of Jews. Whether you know in the diaspora and or of course first and foremost the largest Jewish community in the world, the state of Israel. So you know this is something that we've seen. And now, as we say, you know when we're looking at at uh, Congressman Meeks wanting to have a hearing about U.S. military uh, aid to Israel, uh, you know this is taking on you know new dimensions when you have. Uh, Hadi Amar, who's now the ass assistant, the deputy secretary of state for Israel and the Palestinians in Israel, supposedly as the representative for Secretary of State Blinken. And this is a man who has a long history of open uh, hatred of Israel, hostility towards the Jewish state and support for Hamas. And this is his position now. And he's supposed to be the envoy. Uh, obviously, we can't expect him to be anti-Hamas or pro-Israel because that's not who he is. That's not his his record. And yet he's the representative of the Biden administration on the ground today. So do you have any thoughts about how Israel deals with it? The left in Israel, which in large part is colluding with this, you know, is saying that the uh, the calls for a ceasefire means that Israel just has to stop. You know, it's time to end it. They started calling for a ceasefire for Israel to end it up, you know, wrap it up the first day of this operation. So you know, do you think they're right? Do you think that this is what we have to do? How do you think that we're supposed to be proceeding here? Well, first of all, I think that uh, one of the goals of, of, of political warfare, as we started at our discussion uh, just a little over an hour ago, is to divide the morale of the target population. And here you have, you know, in Israel, you do have more than one voice. You have divided voices over what needs to be happening now. And this is, um, this is regretfully one of the uh, successful outcomes uh, of of uh, classic political warfare is, is really to is to challenge, divide, and conquer the target uh, population, uh, and and so we have a very complex uh, state of affairs here. Uh, I, I do I do think that the majority of Israelis are on the same page. Uh, I think there is there is really real shock at the uh, at the level of of uh, of domestic um, uh, disquiet. I would say by uh, uh, some in the. Israeli Arab uh, community, even though I, I, I frankly assess that the, the majority of the million nine hundred thousand um, uh, Israeli Arabs are are not in favor uh, of what is uh, what has been transpiring. It's really been a minority of of troublemakers, of gangs, and of uh, and other uh, I would call more radical elements in the Israeli Arab community. And I think what Israel has to show is is a tremendous, resolute, and a, a unified determination. Both to demand 
uh, uh, loyalty and, and law abidance by its citizens across the board in Israel, uh, as, well, as well as to um, export, to, to uh, generate and export the correct messaging about Israel's uh, about Israel's being on the right on the right side of this uh, conflict, as it's been on the right side of conflict throughout its history, um, it, Israel it requires a tremendous amount of self confidence and determination and resoluteness on the part of Israel, uh, and, and that is going to I think coalesce um, Israeli uh, the Israeli body body politic and 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 will echo to our friends and allies abroad, and it will send an important message to Israel's adversaries and enemies at the same time. I think I think you're I think you're right. And I think that it's true that, you know, it's not reflected in the media because the Israeli media, unfortunately, is is very far to the left and they don't. And the, the, which is why the public is really an open uh, insurrection, if anything, against the media here. Um, but uh, I think I think you're right. I think that you see a demand uh, across the board, really, in the public to bring this to a resolution. I think that people are shattered by what's happened in, in the Israeli Arab arena, I think we don't have a lot of time. In fact, we may have no time. But, you know, in terms of Mansour Abbas, you know, in a way, he's a riddle because he is a representative of the uh, Islamic movement in Israel, and oh, it's albeit the southern branch, which is considered more moderate, but this is an expression of the Muslim Brotherhood in Israel. And uh, he cut off discussions with the left when they were trying to form a government uh, just last week, because he said, you know, that he wasn't going to support a war against Gaza, so that you know uh, that sort of, in my view, put put to rest any option or any discussion of having a government with his support. But I think, you know, to the extent that he does represent uh, a domestic expression of uh, of the Ab the spirit of the Abraham Accord among Israeli Arabs, we have to figure out a way to cultivate that. I don't think that at this point there's any reasonable way, there's any responsible way to form a government uh, that's dependent on his support. Because uh, if nothing else, of the Israeli uh, Jewish public is in no mood to believe his guarantees after what's been going on and about his, and his pro-Gaza uh, uh, statements over the past several weeks, over the past several days. I think that uh, it's important to figure out how you know, to move forward with the Arabs and hopefully, you know, he will be willing and able to play a central role in that moving forward. But, um, you know, we we have a, a reckoning before us uh, in terms of our relations with with the Arabs. Um, and I and perhaps we should be also working with our new peace partners uh, in the air in the Abraham Accords and seeking really their thoughts on this, because you know, if they really are serious about normalizing their ties with Israel, um, then then they should have an interest in figuring out how to normalize relations between Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis uh, in a manner that secures Israel's future as a Jewish state. Um, I don't. Yeah, maybe I, agree, that's I, I agree very much. I, I do. I think we can leave it on an optimistic note. Mm -hmm. Something happened just the other day that I think many of our friends uh, in college in the West are unaware of. Mansour Abbas is a riddle to uh, to a large degree to to quote you. However, uh, the, uh, to add to the um, to add to the question marks, he did appear for the first time. I think the first time that any Arab leader in Israel appeared following an Arab pogrom and the burning of a, of, of a synagogue in Lod. Several synagogues. Uh, what's that? Several synagogues. Several synagogues in Lod, which is a mixed Jewish Arab um, city. With a Jewish, uh, with a Jewish uh, observant uh, mayor, he appeared with him, went into the synagogue, and publicly denounced um, the Arab, uh, the Arab burning of these synagogues and violence. And even though it came after, you know, several days, no question, it had. We have not seen an Arab leader actually denounce Arab violence against Jews and 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 do it in a way with it with a leader that. You know, in Lod is very much on uh, being targeted, if you will, by the Arab by the Arab population of that city. So I think I think it adds something to this conversation. I don't exactly know what to make of the whole thing, but I do know it was an unprecedented gesture taken by an Arab leader um, in an act of of um, I would say self criticism, a criticism of his own uh, potential base. And the, and and the question out there that we'll leave and we'll have to revisit this together 
is whether that will earn him more support in the Arab sector or will it earn him less support in the Arab sector? That's really an open question. Um, I have my thoughts about it, but we'll have to see how it unfolds because as you say, it's an open riddle and, and all of this uh, uh, latest you know, jihadi assault on Israel has created a number of different questions that we're going to have to answer going forward. Well, I agree with you, Dan. It's been so great. I think that we've had a tremendous discussion. I think it's really important. I hope you guys agree with me. I want to thank Real Clear Politics for posting the podcast of uh, last week's show. And I urge you to post the podcast or or the web uh, version of this week's show as well. Thank you, all you guys in Real Clear Politics. And all of you, you know, the reason that I discuss the information warfare today is because I think it's really important. I also think that both you as viewers and listeners and, and you know, Dan and I as professionals who work in this field, we have a responsibility to get this information out. So I urge, so first of all, thank you for watching or listening to us today. And I, I ask you again to share this discussion with your colleagues, with your friends, with your family. Get Let's get the message out. There's so much disinformation and there's so much deliberate misinformation about the nature of this conflict, about Israel's nature, and about the nature of our enemies that's just flooding all of the communication waves, mass communications in the West and the East and, and in the North and the South. And so let's try to get the truth out. That's why we're doing this. Nobody's getting paid for this, you know, and uh, it's just it's just a matter of life and death, quite simply, as the 3,000, as the people who have been absorbing the 3,250 missiles that have been shot at Israel over the past week can attest to, and as the citizens of Israel who have been subjected to pogroms in mixed Arab Israeli and Israeli Jewish cities over the past week can also attest to. So we need to get this information out so that we can win this war against the enemies, not only of the Jewish people and the Jewish state, but also really of all free peoples in the world. So thank you very much. And thanks, Dan. Thank you, Carolyn. All right. Take care, everybody. And tune in next week for another, for another episode of the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour. Take care. Bye-bye.